Let me say welcome to Friendship Terrace. And those of you who are new to our community, we're 180 affordable apartments. We're all independent. We have people from all across D.C., across the country. And it's a, it's a wonderful, enjoyable place. One of our biggest things is we're affordable, and we also administer 40 Section 8 housing vouchers. For those who would like to see the community when we're done, I have residents who are adjacent to our room here who have said, Chuck, you can bring them in to see my apartment if you like. This is going to be an enjoyable time for all of us. It's not going to be the usual program that we all meet and greet with each other at. Sloan, welcome to Friendship Terrace. Let me begin with words that are not my own. Unknown and often unnoticed, you are a hero nonetheless. For your love, sacrificial, is God at his best. You walk by faith in the darkness of the great unknown, and your courage, even in weakness, gives life to your beloved. You hold shaking hands and provide the ultimate care, your presence, the knowing that you are simply there. You rise to face the giant of disease and despair. It is your finest hour, though you're unaware. You are resilient, amazing, and beauty unexcelled. You are the caregiver, and you have done well. Credit for that goes to Bruce McIntyre, his poem called A Prayer for the Caregiver. I feel very privileged to be here today. Thank you, Chuck. And uh, it's really been a pleasure getting to meet so many of you as, as you came in. I didn't know that I would have that opportunity, and I really am happy that I did. <coughs> Caregiving is a journey most of us will face if we live long enough for some of us sooner than later. Perhaps you are a caregiver. Perhaps you see the time coming when you will be one. Perhaps you are facing another of life's challenges. I would like to bring energy and courage to each of your journeys. I saw my husband's and my story giving meaning to a challenging, painful, and at times overwhelming journey that was sustained by our faith perseverance, as well as a conscious goal to maintain autonomy, his and mine. As different readers of my book have shared how my experience has encouraged them, I realize the unique yet how unique yet similar experiences can be. So regardless of your unique situation and the challenges it presents, I encourage you to be reassured within your experience that there are positives that you can grasp and make a meaningful part of your life. We were a married couple of 20 years who during our last six years were trying to maintain a semblance of order while a raft of challenging ultimate challenges ultimately unraveled our sense of normalcy and altered our lives forever. I'm a lover of words and the dynamics that they bring to a relationship. In saying that, I share with you that I never saw myself as a caregiver but as a part of a couple dedicated to life's journey together. Certainly what transpired for us could not have been anticipated, but nonetheless, it was a part of our journey. On some level, you might say it is a matter of semantics, and I guess that it is, but in any regard, whether caregiver or dedicated mate, I believe the journey would still look the same. My husband's comfort, his quality of care, and our shared peace of mind was my goal which proved to be no less than a struggle each step of the way. My husband, Richard Rogers, was a well-thought-of trial attorney who was on the Pennsylvania Pardons Board. He served his community selflessly and, and participated in many organizations. Dick, or D, as I sometimes called him, passed away January 16, 2007. Cause, hematomas on the brain. D suffered several by, excuse me, severe spinal stenosis of the cervical cord with myelopathy and spinal arthritis. He had three major 10-hour surgeries, periodic seizures, hematomas on the brain from frequent falls, 80% and 90% blocked arteries in the heart, a stent in the vena cava due to blood clots in both legs, and an unspoken to diagnose and treatment for Alzheimer's along with fungal infections and MRSA staph in the bloodstream. His last eight months were in a nursing home, with the last six being on a catheter, an erroneously placed feeding tube, and oxygen at times. 
During those last months, he was completely immobile, being moved from bed to wheelchair by a lift, and unable to verbalize to any understandable degree. What amazed many was the tenacity and the perseverance with which Dick continued through life. He had a faith that became remarkable as he moved toward or forward with determined strength. I came to realize that I mirrored that level of tenacity and perseverance as I walked by his side each step along our journey. Did we gain additional strength from each other? I think perhaps we may have. I'd like to think that. Certainly, our faith was tested. In my book, I state, quote, how does one soar to so many heights in life, then deal with discovering that now what confronts him is bigger than life? Dick's faith became more prominent than ever. Can your faith ever be big enough? How does one walk such a journey with their mate when they too realize the undeniable magnitude of such a situation? Not only did my faith expand, but I decided that with making a decision, whether it be one of immediate consequence or one of just moving through the day, to do so in a manner that I would have no regrets. It meant asking myself endless questions throughout those six years, but this practice will always be a part of my life. It is the determinant that gave and will continue to give me peace. Our uncharted future brought about painful sacrifices and events, but I stand before you and I want you to know that one does not need to deny their depths of feeling to find the silver linings, which I speak to in most of the happenings within my book. There were a number of elements within the caregiving experience that were most profound for me. Truly, the whole journey was, was touched me deeply. I absolutely believe that advocacy affects the quality of care. I cannot express enough, enough the importance of being very present when you have someone close to you in the hospital. Everyone needs an advocate at such a time. I have had doctors tell me more than once that a family member needed to be moved out of a hospital setting as soon as possible to maintain or preserve their well-being. So you know those are not idle words. You are often the patient's needed voice and facilitator. Just think how important that is. I was Dick's voice frequently for times such as his falling out of his hospital bed on his second day in critical care after 10 hour perpectomy surgery in a Miami J collar used for immobilization. His being given a different seizure medication, one he had had a serious reaction to by a new intern in a teaching hospital his being transferred from one facility to another with only a moment's notice, his being roughly treated by an aide in a nursing home, saving him from himself when he struggled to give up driving, and when he all but set a frying pan on fire in his attempt to prepare some food, totally unaware that the smoking oil was just moments away from ignition. There were three separate times I was forced to make decisions that literally rocked my boat. <laughs> Taking Dee to the hospital when he did not want to go, an intubation procedure, and a suggested craniotomy surgery. The list could go on and on with varying degrees of happenings. The most crucial being that his life care wishes were not necessarily appropriately followed. There are happenings we don't have control over. But when we can make a difference, we must. I encourage families to communicate with each other, to let others know what you want in different given circumstances. You can't cover them all, but the areas that you do cover will not be in vain. While living health directive is so important, it can still leave room for interpretation. So I feel we have a responsibility not only to ourselves, but to others, to communicate our wishes clearly. Autonomy was another profound element for us. It was a major focus for both of us, despite the reality of life's adversities, which created the ultimate test. It battered us, but it did not destroy us. I write of many instances where Dee's independence could have been compromised, but I clearly understood the role that independence played in his life, and it was crucial, crucial to his well-being. 
Most importantly, I knew that he needed that sense of freedom to maintain his strength as long as possible. I saw that as a mutual gift because I did not know how I could find peace until I had helped my partner find as much comfort as possible. In my book, I quote, watching him negotiate the walking process often left me feeling slightly helpless as I wanted to make it easier. That was the nurturing side of me that had to find solace in knowing he was much happier making it on his own. I really couldn't make it better. Imagine that. Isn't it amazing the credit that we can give ourselves at times? How many times had I seen him fall and not accept help coming back to a standing position? How many times had I restrained from jumping into the event thinking my assistance was the answer? However, there were times it was, but the test was in knowing what time, what time, what time that was at the end of the quote. Dee's determination to maintain his autonomy is demonstrated over and over again as he struggled to overcome the illnesses that whittled away at his body. He literally carried on through unbelievable odds. My determination to help Dee maintain his autonomy was wrought with considerations and decisions that drove and affected daily events. In the process, I realized the importance of maintaining my autonomy, but willingly compromised when deemed necessary. In my story, I tell of a major compromise when I decided to meet one of Dee's needs that he seemed to have that was pretty critical in an area that had caused me to have panic attacks, rationalizing my fear would either be magnified or cured. I also tell of his last day in court, which was so remarkable. Then there were situations when I had to take a stance just so others would not be negatively affected. And this quote speaks to that. We were entering into a period of feeling I was an adversary. When one is quickly losing their autonomy, how do you convince them of your devotion to what is best for them? That you would love to diminish their pain when in fact they see you as causing it. Too often, Alzheimer's did not allow for that kind of reasoning. Hospice was another profound element. In an article, Making the Best Decision, found in the 2012 Touching Life publication, I was quoted as saying, I didn't understand what hospice was, or I would have thought of it sooner. I realize now the magnitude and the benefits that it brings. I am a believer that hospice not only brings comfort and peace to the dying experience, but hope and quality to the lives that are often extended beyond expectation. And in a few cases, I was surprised to learn that life does go on beyond. The aspect of hospice was far reaching in our case, providing volunteers who came in during the day while I was at work to help bring stimulation into Dick's life. Taking him outside in his wheelchair, reading to him, playing the piano and singing to him, as well as meeting any needs they saw while there. They provided very meaningful insight and literature to the family regarding each different behavioral and physiological change that might be observed as one nears the end of their earthly life. This brought reality to our otherwise unbelievable situation. Hospice, to me, hospice spells compassion on a very special level. And my view of compassion, I put in the book, compassion that special ingredient that creates mental and physical hugs. How can you live without them? It hurts to think that there are those that do. No one should. Compassion, that special ingredient that is expressed in caring and knowing words of sympathy and empathy. Compassion, that special ingredient that creates kind acts that are intended from heartfelt interest and concern. I mentioned, want to mention while talking about hospice how rewarding it was to have a journal on Dee's bedside. Hospice shared the happenings of each of their visits within that journal, and I looked forward to those readings each day when I arrived. They were precious moments for me. I also urge you to make a journal available to all visitors. In my case, I read each writing to Dee so that he would know who had visited and the messages each author wanted to share. Recently, I have heard of an organization called Compassion and Choices, which allows for one to take a role at the time of their death when terminally ill. Dee had expressed not wanting to continue life as he was, 
And how do you help one with that, other than to follow the dictates of the living health director? I would almost feel certain that he could have, if he could have controlled that factor, he would have elected to take his life by his own choosing. A related quote to that, I said, I called for help to get him to the hospital. He didn't want to go. He asked not to go, but he had to go. I would have been the one ending his life if he didn't go. It was clear to me that while it was a possible option theoretically, it was not a choice that I had. My soul was crying. Please, Lord, may your will be done. Another profound element is humor. It is proven to be medicine for our souls, not my discovery. I am a strong proponent of the benefits of humor. Amidst our long game to trauma, I allowed myself to recognize it when it appeared. And I'm sharing this little happening. On occasion, I would notice a very far away look in his eyes. And being aware of the Alzheimer's, there was a time, no, maybe two, that I said to him, D, do you know who I am? D, do you know who I am? If eyes could talk, his did. And what they said to me were, Sloan, what kind of question is that? Now that was a silver lining. This was not a funny ha ha moment, but one where my heart smiled, for his eyes were so expressive, it was just like birds being fed to me. I kind of laugh at myself and never again ask the question. So I say to you, it can be humor that keeps you sane in a situation that makes no sense. I almost called my book The Death Before Dying. It seemed I had already lost my husband before he died. But as I was writing, I became abundantly aware that that was not the case. I wonder how many of you who are caregiving in a very compromised position may feel the same. A quote from my book. When you watch someone trying to utter words, and at best, there may be a faint whisper or a trying to respond to a desire to touch, and they are unable to, you begin to realize how much the loss has ensued. It is a major loss for the person who is debilitated, as well as a loss for those looking on. While you try to minimize the loss, the void calls out to you. It resounds in your heart. You long to attach something of meaning to the absence of anything. Try as you may, reality calls out to you painfully, mercilessly, until acceptance takes hold. All decisions came from me as much as I wanted Dee to be a part of what was impacting him. All conversation was one way, all affection given to me never again to be received. What else was there? A momentary look? was for the most part expressionless with amazement that you tried to read of what you tried to read into that contact. But you move on, knowing you can't make it different, you can't make it something it is not. And when you do stop trying and when you do stop trying, do you want to stop? Do you stop? And another uh, chapter. Despite for, for, for excuse me, for survival took precedence over all, all the time. Our relationship was about de surviving his ill fate and my surviving the experience of being there to help him through each inch, literally each inch of the way. But it probably wasn't survival that Dee was fighting for, but dying with dignity. Letting go is a very difficult thing to do when you are focused on providing as much comfort as possible for one. It's like a dichotomy. So I suggest in closing, it is up to each of us how we view a challenge and what we make of it. As Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says, learn to get in touch with silence within yourself and know that everything in life has purpose. There are no mistakes or coincidences. All events are blessings given to us to learn from. From the tree of life, each leaf must fall, the green, the gold, the great, the small. Each one in God's own time he'll call. With perfect love, he gathered you, my dear. And that's my story. And I'm happy to take questions. I want to thank you for taking some time. I just wanted us to have time doing what we do to step back and get into the feeling of what we do. We do so much of here's the rake, here's 
what we have to do, fill in this form, what's it cost, what do we, and we just have to realize behind all of that are deep, intense feelings for the people we're dealing with, their family, and our own. We're here to make it as easy as we can, to make it as enriching as we can, to make it as affordable as we can. So Sloan's back there. Any who would like to see Friendship Terrace, we are an affordable, independent senior community here in Northwest DC. You can rent a studio and with an evening meal, all the utilities for 1,110 a month. And then we also have 40 Section 8 housing vouchers that can make that rent figure 30% of income for the balance of one stay once they're in that program. Two great residents have offered to share their apartments, and so if you would like to see them, see me. But first, stop by and see Sloan, and thank you for taking time to be with us. Take care. Have a great weekend. Thank you.